We are at Acrisure Stadium in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for the Blue Gold game to close out the 15 workout spring session of the Pittsburgh Panthers. And welcome everybody along with Rod Gilmore. I'm Doug Sherman. So glad you're with us this afternoon. It is great to be talking football in the middle of April. And for the Pitt Panthers, they are looking to forget about last year's 3-9 and nine record, turn the page, and they have done so by changing the offense dramatically. They have a new offensive coordinator. His name is Cade Bell. He's 31 years old. And Rod, he tells us his stated goal for this coming fall is for the Panthers to score 50 points every game. Listen, he did pretty well at the FCS level. But listen, we, we talk about Pat Narduzzi and Pitt, and we know we're going to get great defense. That's what they've done for 10 years under him. The focus today for me and for Pitt fans everywhere is really kind of the offense. And I think there are three things that we're looking for. One, we just want to see this offense and what it looks like. Two, we want to check out the quarterback play. And then three, who are the impact players on offense? Who are the guys that are going to make the big plays for them? I think that's what Pitt fans want to find out about today. Well, Coach Narduzzi is just a, an interested observer in today's scrimmage. He joins us down on the sideline right now. And, Coach, what are you most looking for out of this afternoon? You know, I want to see our guys play fast and play the game the way it's supposed to be played in Pittsburgh. Uh, you know, uh, I want to see our guys play tough. I want to see them take care of each other. You know, I'm hoping if there's a you know, catch over the middle and there's a kill shot, I want our guys to hopefully pull off and not make that shot. But uh, I want to see our guys play football the way it's uh, supposed to be played. Pat, it, it's been uh, pro-style offense for you for so long, and now it's a little different. You okay with the switch? I love it. I love it. I'm a defensive guy, um, but, you know, I think all defensive guys know offense and know what hurts you. And uh, I'm really excited about what our offense could do this year for us. Thanks so much, Coach. Thanks, we guys. will talk to you after the game. Hail to Pitt. Well, here's a look at the rules being used today as the quarterback, Eli Holstein, the redshirt freshman transfer from Alabama, comes out. And he has had a good spring so far, Rod, and has a lot of folks here in Western PA talking about what he could bring to this program. Well, I think it was a bit of a surprise to a lot of people that he has jumped in as the number two quarterback, if you will. He was the second quarterback drafted by the players for this team. So he jumped ahead of Christian Bayer. And so a lot of folks want to see him in action today. And on first down, Pitt goes to the air. It's incomplete. Trying to find Dejon Reynolds, the redshirt junior from Springfield, Illinois. Our quarters today, a little shorter than normal but we have conventional college football scoring. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> I hate those sprint games where you get a point for a tackle and a stop or whatever, and you have no idea what the score is. I have a hard <laughs> enough time keeping track of two, three, six, and seven, let alone when they come up with other stuff. So we've got second down and 10 after the incompletion from Eli Holstein. Daniel Carter, the starting running back, takes the handoff and gets, no, it's a fake. Holstein, wearing that red jersey, gets hit for a loss, and that'll bring up third down and long. He, he did get hit. Isaiah Neal, that's a no-no. You're not supposed to touch the guy in red. But I'm all for it, former defensive player. And working with tempo this year. And he is down with a flag that's been thrown. Jimmy Scott credited with that sack. Defense, more than 11 players on the field. Five-yard penalty, third down. Uh, the one thing you notice about this offense right away is that, you know, there's no huddle. I mean, Pitt has been a huddling team for the longest and quick pace. That has not been their style under Pat Narduzzi for 10 years, but they have made the switch to a spread up-tempo offense this year. Another flag, pre-snap. And this is not to be unexpected when you are... Start. Offense, number 55. Five-yard penalty, third down. When you are installing an entirely new offense, that penalty goes against B.J. Williams, who, by the way, the sophomore was named today the 2024 Ed Conway Award winner for the most improved offensive player in the spring for the first year offensive coordinator Kate Bell all of 31 years old <laughs> he is Kerwin Bell's son played for his dad at Jacksonville pass complete over the middle for a first down it's Reynolds on the receiving end 16 yard pickup 
on the delivery from Holstein. And Cade Bell led an offense at Western Carolina at the football championship subdivision. That was outstanding. Keep it on the ground on first down. Yards after contact for Daniel Carter. Javon McIntyre, one of the terrific safeties who returned this year on the stop. You mentioned that Bell wants to shoot for 50 points a game. They did do it four times last year at Western Carolina. Holstein with some air underneath that pass down the sideline. It is incomplete. Looked like a potentially catchable ball, but Kenny Johnson could not haul it in. I love the way Holston put this ball out there. He gave Johnson a chance to make a play. So many times you see quarterbacks overthrow the receiver and not give him a chance to make a play. Third down. Holstein's going to run for it, and they mark him as a first down. Again, no. the guys in red obviously no. not getting touched, and no. he didn't get there. He's short of that. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> That's where the red jersey gets you the first down. So we've already established that the officials are against the defense, right, Ron? Absolutely. Aren't as they always. always? <laughs> Strike over the middle. It's caught. A catch for first down. Johnson with his reception first of this spring game pick up of 19 yards I love the way Johnson ran that slant over the middle Holstein now with an empty formation now Joel's golf the freshman running back from York PA comes back flag goes down pass is picked off well, we'll Johnson see if the play stands. Javante Royal with the interception. Yeah, Johnson fell down. It's not that the ball was poorly thrown. Johnson fell down. In the neutral zone, it's snap. Five yard penalty. First down. You know, you can you can see on this replay clearly offsides. And when you are facing a no huddle team and that's not been, you know, kind of the, the norm around practice, you, you have to get used to it. I mean, obviously they play against teams that have run no huddle, but day in and day out in practice, they've been facing a pro style. So this is an adjustment for the defense as well. Goff, the true freshman who has opened some eyes this spring with the carry. He is from Central York High School. He's got speed to burn. Apparently runs his 100 meters in 10.8 seconds. A three-star who picked Pitt over Boston College, Duke Rutgers, JMU. He has shown signs to potentially be a contributor this fall. Snap is dropped and covered at about the 33-yard line. What do you think so far? Going too fast, you get a couple mistakes. Well, I think that is to be expected. Yeah, nothing wrong with that snap, though. That's uh, Holstein just dropping it. Yeah, Lyndon Cooper is getting the start at center in place of Terrence Moore, the returning center. We've got three starting offensive linemen not playing in this game. A number of players who are injured or a little bit dinged up and figured they would protect him from any sort of hit. That is a first down pitch and catch to Kenny Johnson, the explosive receiver also out of York, PA. And if you have not seen this offense before and you're wondering about Western Carolina, that, that was really a pass first offense and tempo and really trying to take advantage of, of matchups. Most spread teams try to get the ball out quickly and they're focused on space and timing and not necessarily matchups. Take the handoff to Carter, trying to find the tight end, Gavin Bartholomew, one of the captains for this blue team today. We got a chance to meet him over at the uh, athletic complex yesterday yep. and uh, ask him about his mullet. He uh, says, of course, <laughs> business in the front, party in the back. Party in the back. Well, and this offense is going to be interesting for him because most spread offenses don't use the tight end very effectively, but he's a guy that you have to, you have to pay attention to. You have to work him into the, into the offense. On second down, pass into double coverage 
incomplete again trying to find Kenny Johnson who by the way was drafted first overall by the gold team seniors and captains in the draft on Wednesday and among those who made the choice Gavin Bartholomew and you know there was some lobbying going on both before and during that draft to make absolutely. sure absolutely it's and the playground you, rules you don't yeah. want to be the last guy no absolutely you want to be the first guy you want to make sure you get your word in with your guy too hey you're gonna you're gonna pick me on your team right <laughs> So it's third down, stack receivers to the top of your screen. Now in motion, Dejon Reynolds looking that way. Now Holstein steps up on the move, misses his intended target, which was Reynolds. And this new offense, we will see more motion and movement, right, Rod? Yeah. Yeah, and part of that is to identify coverages and to create matchups. And when we talked to Cade Bell about this, he said, he, as many others, were so impressed with the LSU offense in 2019 under Joe Burrow that that is something that he incorporated. That kind of passing attack, vertical, a lot of deep throws. On a windy afternoon, our first field goal attempt comes from Sam Carpenter. He's got the distance, and it is good. Three points on the board as we are underway in the annual blue gold game here in Pittsburgh. With Rod Gilmore, Doug Sherman back in Pittsburgh. And we've got a 3 0 start. The gold team on top of the blue game, uh, blue team on this pit spring game on a beautifully sunny day, although it is breezy and uh, brisk. It feels like a yeah. fall Saturday for football, Rod. Don't, don't let the sunshine fool you. Well, it's windy. It's a little chilly. <laughs> All the rain they have had here in western Pennsylvania in recent days. They are thrilled to see the sun for the first time in a while. Yeah, this is a glorious day. So Sam Carpenter it just means kicks so it off short. And we are pleased to be joined by one of the greats in pit football history, Lewis Reddick, our colleague from ESPN. How are you? Good, guys. How are you guys doing up there? Well, we're warm. How are you down there in the wind? You know what? Look, I, I'm admittedly very, very soft when it comes to cold <laughs> weather. Um, as, as, as I've gotten up there in age, it's yeah. gotten worse. But I got layers on, dude. I got layers on, so I'm good down here. And it's it's just cool to be back here. And there's a lot of excitement with the program in the city. It's, it's, just, it's just good. It's just like coming home, man. That's yeah. what it is. That is awesome. Nice look, too, man. I love the jacket you're you're rocking right now. Yeah, this this whole thing, Rod, I mean, this this whole brainstorm, this collaboration between Pitt and myself and Mitchell and Ness is just kind of like, it really, it's exceeded my expectations. And quite honestly, I don't, I don't really even know what that means. Only because I, I knew it was going to be good. I just didn't know it was going to be, you know, this good. Outside today in, in front of the stadium, there were people who were just snapping the stuff up at the pop-up that we had constructed out there. The people really seemed to like the gear. This jacket's one of my favorites. Hey, you got to turn, and, around. turn um, around. We'll around see what happens. Yeah, I mean, it's Look at um, that. That this, is awesome. This is pretty cool. So it's just, um, we'll see how it all goes. But again, I mean, anything I can do to help this university and put it back on a national stage, obviously the most important part is what you're seeing out here behind me on the field. That's the most important part, winning football games, being competitive in the ACC and on the national stage, that's where the focus is. But I'm just trying to do my part and just show people that this school, you know, since I was a little kid, it means a lot to me. Yeah, before we talk about this year's football team, I want to ask you about as a two-time academic All-American, obviously your schoolwork was very important to you, and you came back to deliver the commencement speech two years ago. Yeah. What's the connection for you with the university outside of athletics? Yeah, you know, I, I think that the connection that naturally that I have with this university is the fact that while I was here in the four years that I was here, I was able to, you know, maintain a pretty good perspective on the fact that I needed to take advantage of making sure that I set myself up for my career after football. Obviously, when people come here and they go to any Power 5 school, you know, a lot of football players think, look, it's just about football, and we'll, we'll worry about my after, after football life when the time comes. I kind of kept that in the forefront of my mind, and I think the people here recognize that. They recognize it by how seriously I took my academics. Quite honestly, I didn't have a whole lot of fun in college, dude. Okay, I spent a lot of time at the football stadium and then in the library and then down at the Cathedral of Learning because I really wanted to take care of business. And I think that's something that 
that, that message never gets old. I think you want to make sure that the youngsters now understand that, look, you got to be well-rounded. You have to make sure that you cover your bases because this is just a small snippet of your life, your actual on-the-field playing experiences. And it really can set you up for a lot of opportunities afterwards, but you have to have the right training, right? You have to have the right schooling, the right the, the right basis of knowledge to be able to take advantage of it. And I took advantage of that, and that's why that's one of the things that Pitt brings me back here to make sure that that message gets across. Lewis, it, it's a great message, and I've always been a believer that you should strive as an athlete to have a greater non-athletic career yeah. than your athletic career. And you know, well, you know what's interesting about that, Rod? I'm glad you, I'm glad you brought that up. Is see, a lot of athletes don't like to really face that that fact that more times than not. That's how things work out. Right. Like a lot of time, look, there's there's obviously people like the great Aaron Donald who will be here in a little while, who wind up having Hall of Fame careers, earn so much money, generational money, that it really doesn't matter, you know, their level of quote unquote formal education because they were able to maximize their career in very unique ways. But for the vast majority of us, yeah, you can wind up, you know, setting a nice foundation from which you can then build from based off of your athletic career. But really what matters, the, like the really the kind of impact that you really have happens after your playing time is done on the football field. And a lot of guys don't want to admit that. You know, even when I was in school, like it used to be cool to or rather it wasn't cool to always go to the library. It wasn't cool to always be studying and always, you know, and not going to parties and all. But I, I try to tell people like I tell my own kids, actually, it is pretty damn cool. And I'll tell you why because my second career after my playing days has far exceeded anything I did on the football field. Yep. But it started here, yeah. but it's far exceeded anything I did on the football field. And I'm very proud of that. And uh, we'll see how far we yeah, can take and that it. That should be the goal. Listen, let me take you back onto the field for a hot second. Yep. So Pitt has gotten rid of the pro style offense yep. and moved to a spread. How, yep. how do you feel about it? What do Pitt fans think about it? A lot of college coaches looking broad. I know you travel around the country and you talk to a lot of different coaches. Um, scoring points, bringing an exciting brand of offense, you know, to stadiums around the country are exactly what recruits want to see, mm -hmm. fans want to see, and make people excited to be a part of those programs that are able to do that. And not just on the offensive side. It's not just going to attract more skilled players, more offensive linemen, more coaches who want to be around that program because you're prolific on offense. It also has an effect on the defensive side because defensive players go, hey, you know what? If we can just get a couple stops and I can be a part of that program, we're going to win on a big level and then the NIL money is going to get crazy and we're all going to benefit. Offensive fireworks, scoring points in the way in which you do it is no question in a very, very important part of you building your program now. And if you can't do that, and if you don't have that as part of your DNA and a part of, you know, fundamentally how you approach the game, you're going to be behind. Well, I think it's a great move for Pitt, and it helps. I think a lot of people fail to realize that now most high school quarterbacks mm -hmm. are running a spread system yep. and not working in a pro-style system. So yep. there's a huge transition, and, you know, you've got the draft coming up, and we're seeing more and more quarterbacks when they come out of college have to adjust to the NFL style. But you need, in this day and age, you've got to have quarterbacks who can play in a spread system at the college level. Yeah, and there's, you know, even at the pro level, there are components of it at, at the pro level. Offensive coaches in the NFL understand that, hey, look, it's not about trying to shoehorn players into, quote, unquote, that pro system, meaning always working from under center. Everything is three, five, seven step drop. Everything is, you know, run, run, pass, or first down play action on, you know, and then uh, throw a screen and then spread it out and see if you can pick up the third down. A lot of times on first down, they're spreading you out nowadays. Yep. RPOs have become a big part of it. Yep. You know, high completion percentage throws have become a big part of it. And that's smart on their part. So I think, you know, the whole pro style is kind of like going, you know, by way of the dinosaur a little bit. And now it's just about, look, how can we get these young quarterbacks to play quickly, play efficiently, play winning football, because really that's what they're all after. They're all after, they're all chasing the same thing, and that's that Lombardi, and however they need to do it, 
they'll do it. Yeah, I'm with you, pal. Listen, thank you so much for joining us and for rocking the swag and sharing some of that with us and for sharing some insights on the Pitt program. The offensive style of the future is, is here at Pitt, so we'll, we'll see that and enjoy it. We'll talk to you soon, buddy. You bet. Thanks for having me on, dude. Thank you, Lewis. All righty. Always learn something when you watch and listen to that man on television. We no appreciate doubt. him joining us here at his alma mater. You know, he's not going to get much rest when he starts working on that draft. He's going to be on no. the set for three days. No, and his alma mater had a wonderful draft last year. Six Panthers were taken. That tied with Clemson for the most in last year's draft out of the ACC. They won't have that many this year, but there are a couple of guys who have the potential to be drafted when it comes up later this month. Question for you. We're going to hit the quarter in pretty soon, but 19, the quarterback. You know that guy? Uh, I recognize him. He's Nate Yarnell, the yeah. redshirt junior from Austin, Texas, who started the last two regular season games last year and is the number one, at least for now, and has had a good spring practice. Running back was Montrevious Lloyd, and uh, that will take us to the end of the first quarter. How about been modified here, 10 minute quarters, so we're heading to break in a second. How about we talk about Nate when we come back? Let's do that. He uh, is going to be important to this offense and to this team in the fall. This is well, not a prolific offensive start to this scrimmage. It's the gold on top, 3-0 here in Pittsburgh. Two more games cap off our spring football schedule on ACCN and ACCN Extra today with Virginia Tech coming up at 3 o'clock and Miami's spring game at 4 Eastern. ACC Network Extra is ACC Network's complimentary streaming platform, which is accessible through the ESPN app on your smartphone, tablet, connected streaming device like your TV, or by going to ESPN.com slash watch. Jake Renda, a reserve tight end with his first reception. On the pass from Nate Yarnell, the incumbent starting quarterback here at Pitt. Six foot six, 215 pounds out of Austin, Texas. As you mentioned, started a couple of games to end the season last year. And he has a really nice arm, and there's a look at it. When the game start. Pass interference as he tries to find Kanate Mumpfield, who is being defended by Noah Biglow. I found it interesting in our conversation with Nate Yarnell yesterday. Of course, he's from Austin, Texas, and played at Lake Travis High School. Pass ah. interference, defense, number 28, 15-yard penalty, first down. So for the skill that he has, he was offered his first Division I football scholarship as a ninth grader by the University of Houston. Major Applewhite. Very nice. But he wound up not playing a lot in high school because he was playing behind a lot of other quarterbacks. In fact, in the last 20 years, they have turned out 10 wow. different Division I quarterbacks. So he did not play, but as a backup his junior year, got into a few games, senior year got hurt, and then he hasn't played that much here. So it's been a long time since he has been a number one guy and gotten lots of reps. You saw that list of alums headed by Baker Mayfield. Gail Gilbert, they've had some quarterbacks at Lake Travis. And you're right, it's kind of phenomenal when you think about Nate Yarnell and the fact that he didn't play much in high school, hasn't played much, but this, this is his time. He's coming to the spring as the number one guy, and the offense is something he's familiar with from high school, the concept of it, and so it's his chance to get control of this offense and put his stamp on that quarterback position. Well, on that first possession, Yarnell was a perfect four for four passing for 34 yards. And the offensive coordinator, Kate Bell, says of Yarnell, told us yesterday, he's a pro in how he attacks every day. He watches tons of film and is getting, again, the most reps he has ever had, certainly here at Pittsburgh and in a long, long time. Whistle blown before the pass was delivered. So he is down. Again, wearing that red jersey, you can't touch him. Now, see, defense never gets it their way. <laughs> now, <laughs> Here we you go blow again. the whistle, that's a sack. But if you don't blow it a sack, Jesse Anderson gets a pick. And Jesse Anderson is saying, what, what sack? That's my pick. <laughs> well, the sack is Jeremiah Marcelin, the freshman from Opelika, Florida, who has been showing promise this spring. You see Cade Bell talking into his walkie-talkie, communicating with his quarterback, Nate Yarnell, a new technology being tested out this year 
like we have seen in the NFL for years. College now having that. And so one player on offense and one player on defense, oftentimes the Mike linebacker, which is the case here for Pitt with Brandon George, have direct uh, communication with the coach on the sideline. That was Aaron Donald's nephew with the sack over there. That is Elliot Donald, a redshirt junior from right here in Pittsburgh out of the powerhouse Central Catholic High School program. I think in, in fairness to, to Nate Yarnell, we should point out he is working with the number two offensive line based on what occurred with the draft. The draft did not draft the offensive line. The offensive lines were set. They want to keep those together. The starting offensive line is with the gold team, and the number two offensive line is with the blue team. What is he eating? The head coach is eating a sandwich during the game. <laughs> a little different sense than when they get going in oh, the like, regular you know, season. He's not calling plays. Well, here's uh, what is down the road. August 31st, Kent State will be here, then at Cincinnati, then a big game. One of the biggest games, if not the game on the schedule every year, the rivalry game, the backyard brawl on the 14th. The Mountaineers will be here in Pittsburgh. Uh, that'll be fun. You know, there, there's a connection to this game with that. This is a blue-gold game, but Pitt's wearing white right. jerseys. It's blue and white. Mm. You know why? Because? They don't have a gold jersey. They don't want to look like the Mountaineers. They don't want to look like West Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> it is a true rivalry. You know, we're only an hour, hour 15 away from Morgantown, and it goes back long before you and I were around, and uh, the, the passion still runs deep, even though they have not been conference rivals for a number of years. The rivalry is still very much real. Daniel Carter is the running back. Tries to pick his way through the right side of the line, able to pick up maybe three yards. Rodney Hammond, the presumed number one running back for Pitt, is wearing a red jersey today. We had been told up until yesterday, Rod, that he was not going to play. He got a whatever, some sort of yeah. nagging injury, but uh, they have said he is available and wearing a red jersey. So I don't know exactly how that works. If you're the running back, how do you play in a red jersey? Yeah, I see how the running back plays. I don't see how the defense treats him. Right. And that, that guy comes running through the hole. You treat him like a running back, you take a shot at him. But if he's got a red jersey on, you're supposed to stop. They better blow the whistle. Well, at the moment, Hammond is sitting on the bench along with the quarterbacks in his red jersey. Jewel's Goff is the running back. That uh, pass deflected and falls incomplete. Bam Brimma, the sixth year from Worcester, Massachusetts, making the defensive play. And there's number six, Rodney Hammond. Probably wouldn't mind having a red jersey for a regular season game. I'm going to run to the house every time you give me the football. Untouchable. Oh, man. Well, he did not participate in yesterday's 14th and final practice of spring football. And this is the way they wind it down. I do like the fact, and we talked about it a little bit off the top, that Coach Narduzzi has gone back in his 10th year to what he prefers for the end of spring practice by having this more traditional type of scrimmage. Agreed. You know, the players get excited about it because it, it is a competition. That pass intercepted by Javon McIntyre. The redshirt junior free safety out of Bear, Delaware. Well, He's not going to get a takeaway sticker on his helmet right now, but that was a big part of the 14 workouts leading up to this one. He is one of the playmakers on the defensive side for Pitt again this coming fall. Here is tonight's featured ACC baseball matchup. NC State squares off against number two Clemson in the second game of their three game series right here on ACCN and the ESPN app. With Rod Gilmore, I'm Doug Sharp, 516 remaining in the first half here in Pittsburgh of this blue gold game that has, to my mind, been controlled pretty much by the defensive line because. You know, there are a lot of offensive linemen not playing in this game. In fact, three of the five expected starters in the fall are not playing. Their center, Terrence Moore, their left guard, Ryan Jacoby, and the left tackle, Branson Taylor, are not competing here today. Yeah, both quarterbacks have been under duress, haven't had time to get rid of the ball, and that's 
affected our ability to really sort of appreciate and analyze the offense because the defensive lines have been dominant so far. Two sacks and a fumble, a forced fumble that last series by the gold defense. And they've been around the quarterback on this drive as well. Derek Davis Jr., the running back, gets his second straight carry right up the middle. And he is stopped for a loss. We have yet to mention Dayon Hayes, who made that last tackle and is going to be a big part of the defensive front for Pittsburgh this year. There are those who think he has a future in the NFL. Yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me. Listen, you know, when I put on the tape and watch this offensive line from last season, the last couple of games, there is no doubt B.J. Williams, Terrence Moore, and Ryan Baer, young guys that played on the right side last year, will be outstanding. The question is how you fill those other two spots up front. Let's see what the blue team has up its sleeve on fourth down and two. Nate Yarnell has timeout called to talk it over. So what's the strategy here in a spring scrimmage on fourth and two in field goal range? It's always go, isn't it? <laughs> of and course. Post, the chart would always tell you go in this situation, too. Um, fourth down and two or less, you, you're going to go. Um, I mean, why are you going to kick a field goal here? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you got to get those guys some work sometime, but this is, this is not the best environment for kicking. The wind has been swirling. It's swirling right now. And I guess if you want your kicker to get a shot at that and see what that's like, go ahead and give him one. He's made one already on the day. Yeah, as soon as you think it's blowing from left to right, it's blowing right to left. It is a cool, brisk day here in Pittsburgh. You see the temperature's up to 57. You, you know, you miss about 19 miles an hour. Let's see what they do on this fourth down. They certainly should go. Here we go. The center is Matt Altman. And they keep it on the ground. And that is a first down. Derek Davis Jr., the LSU transfer, who spent three years in Baton Rouge, coming home to his home city of Pittsburgh with the first down carry. Yeah, they, they've got a stable of running backs. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out for Pitt. I'm excited to see a little bit more of Desmond Reed. He is the small sort of third down back who came over from Western Carolina. Uh, he's exciting. And so I'm curious to see him. We saw him a little bit earlier today, but I want to see him get more touches and see what he does out here. Elliot Donald was the injured player. He was able to work his way back to the sideline. Here's some of the other impact transfers, and we've heard so much this week about Desmond Reed, who followed the offensive coordinator, Kate Bell, from Western Carolina. Here's what Pat Narduzzi says of Reed. He's the toughest dude I've been around. He will stick his nose in any A-gap. Yeah. And that goes along with being lightning quick yeah. and really good with the football. He's only about a buck 70, you know, so he's not a big guy. And you saw the list of impact transfers that have come over. That pass complete to Zion Fowler L, redshirt freshman from Jersey City. And again, you had an opportunity to watch some of the Western Carolina tape from oh, last year. What did you see of Desmond Reed yeah. against the Power Conference opponents? I, I watched him against Georgia Tech, and I watched him against Arkansas last year. And he is tough. He didn't shy away from anything. He is not afraid of anybody. He's a guy who has great change of direction. He's got great speed. He catches the ball out of the backfield really, really well. So he brings a dimension, I think, to this offense Holding. that Pitt hasn't had in a while. 67. 10-yard penalty, third down. That holding penalty on. Here he comes. He's back on the field now. Ty Ray with that penalty. So Reed's back on the field. Let's see if they get him the ball. He's listed at 5'8", 175 from Miramar, Florida. Generous. Was an FCS second team All-American last year. Former consensus Southern Conference Player of the Year. Reed goes out into the flat. Pass from Yarnell is deflected at the line of scrimmage. You know, the surprising thing about this defensive line, the performance for both teams, is that this is a rebuilt defensive line. They lost a lot of guys up front and brought in a lot of transfers. But we shouldn't be surprised. Pat Narduzzi consistently creates effective defensive fronts. So 
we shouldn't be surprised that just because there are new guys in here at the defensive line is being this effective. By the way, that was the first incompletion of the day for Nate Yarnell. He had completed his first seven attempts for 56 yards. Setting up the screen, pass is caught. Desmond Reed. That's the guy. Breaks away. That is the guy. And he's into the end zone for a touchdown, but there is a flag back near the line of scrimmage. If it stands, it'll be a 27 yard score. See what I'm talking about with this guy? <laughs> I mean, he is so quick and his change of direction, and, and he's not just a scat back, you know, who is afraid. Ten yard penalty, third down. He's not afraid of contact. I mean, you can run him inside. You don't want to do it a lot, but you run him inside, and he will stick his nose in there. But this play here, everything you need to know about it. Make guys miss. Nice little stiff arm. Great vision. But it does come back. Cameron Montero, freshman wide receiver from Brockton, Massachusetts, called for the penalty. But that does not diminish the nope. fact that Reed gives you a glimpse right yeah. there what we might see exciting. this fall. Very exciting. So the score remains 3 nothing. gold. Reed remains on the field on third down and long. Yarnell buys himself some time, finds a receiver, and the pass is incomplete. Hey, Doug. Maverick Rossio, the receiver. We, we saw Reed show you his skills. How about this toughness? Watch him step up and take on this blitzing backer. Yeah, how much size was he giving up? Oh, there? what? 40 pounds? Easily. 50? He doesn't care. And Reed is still young. He's only 19 years old, doesn't turn 20 until July. He once scored five touchdowns in one half against the Citadel. Explosive. Special. So now a 50 yard field goal attempt upcoming for Ben Sauls, the number one place kicker for the Pitt Panthers. Hold is good. The Southpaw boots it up. And with the wind swirling, that is a impressive field goal. That is something. Pitt's active leading score, 171 points. The redshirt senior from Tip City, Ohio. He's got his first field goal of the spring game, and the game me, is tied at three. Let me ask you this. A little sloppy at times out there. Mm -hmm. um, not as much on the offensive side, the big plays. I mean, we, we've talked about why. So are you OK with that? You're a little disappointed you haven't seen more big plays? I'm not at all disappointed. You know, we haven't even talked about the defensive coordinator, Randy Bates, who has yeah. been here for such great work under Pat Narduzzi for a number of years. This now his seventh year. And while the offense gets most of the attention under normal circumstances, here at Pitt this year, it's getting most of the attention. But there are a lot of things that have been tweaked and, and are going to be a little bit different for this pit defense. Yeah, but if it's not broke, you know, don't fix it. Now, they want to be a little bit more aggressive. And when I hear that, that tells me that they want their players to play fast and not to think and read as much. So, for example, you don't want a guy to think about which gap he has to have. You want to assign him a gap and have him go get it after the snap. Things like that. Maybe well, this, being this defense, Randy Bates says, you know, we're real deep at safety, still trying to figure out the corners. Ryland Gandy is thought to be the only starter for sure on the corner. His D-line, he calls an island of misfit toys, but he's proud of them. And this is kind of the work that they have done in recent years. Well, you're going to get good defense out of one of his uh, squads. Randy Bates has been around for a long time, has done a great job. And you can count on pit defense being good. Last season, this defense got tested a lot because the offense was so bad. Mm -hmm. It put the defense in a tough situation, you know, not just on the field, but mentally. If you felt like the offense wasn't going to score, that's an additional burden as a defensive player that you really don't want to have to carry. Here is quarterback Eli Holstein, the redshirt freshman transfer from Alabama, who a year ago got to Tuscaloosa, uh, Tuscaloosa as a top 30 nationally recruit, a four star from Zachary, Louisiana. So a lot of folks who are excited about his arm strength. And so he is presumably number two on the depth chart. It's interesting that Christian Bayer started five games last year. Mm -hmm. And up until three days ago, you would have said he was number two on the depth chart. But Eli Holstein's own teammates on Wednesday in the draft chose him. That is that is the most significant thing because players know and players are out there watching every day. And when the players do a draft and they 
Offense, number 50. Five yard penalty, second down. And, and they selected Holstein over Veyer as the second quarterback. That tells you what the players think, who they think is the second best quarterback. Mm -hmm. Well, we are not seeing everything out of Holstein today. He's been dealing with a hamstring injury that has limited him, but he is said to be not just a strong arm. He has enough athletic ability to make plays running the football as well. On play action, Holstein under a little bit of pressure, buys himself some time, throws on the run. Had a man, couldn't find him out near midfield. It falls incomplete, trying to get to Israel Polk, a redshirt freshman from Richmond, California. Well, you could see as he moved there, he's not comfortable, and he couldn't get anything on that throw. And that's the impact of the hamstring injury. And he just wasn't comfortable moving and threw that with all arm. And he is one of five scholarship quarterbacks currently on Pat Narduzzi's roster. And well, we're just a couple of days away from the uh, transfer portal opening up again, and it would surprise nobody if there is significant movement, as there is everywhere around the country in the next coming days. And so this scrimmage today may make it more clear for certain people, hey, this is where I want to be, or maybe I want to look Good elsewhere. Point. Yeah, and, you know, for, for coaches, the portal is a time of anxiety because they're not certain what's going to happen with their team. You know, you think you have a roster, and maybe you, maybe you don't have a, a roster. The things that you expect, what you see out here, might be different. From the player's perspective, if you're a quarterback who's buried on the depth chart, having the portal open up, it's great. It gives you an opportunity to decide whether you need to be here or move on. And we see quarterbacks transfer more than any other position group in college football, the top players and quarterbacks. Well, we have reached the two-minute warning, which is new in college football this year. So it's a one-minute break today for this two-minute warning late in the first half of this annual Blue Gold game here at Acrisure Stadium in Pittsburgh with Rod Gilmore. I'm Doug Sherman. Just and, to put uh, a, a period on that quarterback discussion, I don't think anyone's going to have a roster with four scholarship quarterbacks in college football. Okay. That's going to be hard to keep because guys – are looking for opportunities to play. And if you are a sophomore, junior, you're probably hunting. If you are a freshman, you got time, you're gonna sit around or so. Well, Holstein spent just one year at Alabama and he decided yep. to hit the portal and yep. came here to Pittsburgh and got here in January and has had a good spring. Both he and Nate Yarnell are said to be the guys who've taken care of the football the best as well. The fewest turnovers during the first 14 practices we did have scrimmages as well and apparently they have separated themselves Brandon George one of the captains today and uh, a veteran stalwart in his sixth year in the program having himself a good spring uh, what what a young man he, he's a guy who actually put his name in the portal after last season and then came back to Pitt and said that this is home and sometimes you feel like you've been around too long and you need to take a look around, and he did, and decided he needed to be here. On the receiving end, that's Gavin Bartholomew, the starting tight end. Yeah, Brandon George, in talking to him yesterday, I love the fact that he felt responsible, his, his sense of responsibility, saying the city deserves better than 3-9, and nine, referencing last year's record and he has a great affinity for the school and for the city and for the program because he was largely under recruited coming out of Berks Catholic High School in Reading and, and talking to him about the first time he received a division one scholarship offer from Howard University. Yeah. It was emotional for him because yeah. he didn't know that day would ever come and eventually got more offers and got himself here to Pittsburgh. Yeah. And, and he said, you know, this place is home and we heard a couple of players talk about doing right by the city. And that three and nine is not representative. But this is a city of hardworking, blue-collar folks, and the team needs to reflect that. The team needs to fight and to win. I found that refreshing. Yeah. So we've got a timeout with a minute 12 remaining in the half. Yeah, we had a chance to talk both uh, to the quarterback, Nate Yarnell, and the returning middle linebacker, Brandon George, yesterday at their complex. And really appreciate the hospitality that we have gotten from the entire University of Pittsburgh football staff this week, making ourselves welcome. 
tremendous restaurant recommendation for last night. Yeah, <laughs> really, really fantastic. And I, I think the other thing that's unique about coming here is that they share a facility with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Mm -hmm. And so players get to see the pros really just a few feet away and how they show up and how they work. And it's really unique. And I think it's, it's fantastic and fascinating. On second and short, Dejon Reynolds with another catch. That'll move the sticks with a minute seven remaining in the half. And if you are a pit player and you're lucky enough to be drafted by the Steelers, you go to the same facility. You would know how to get there without your GPS. Just look at Kenny Pickett a couple of years ago. Ball just thrown away by Holstein. Carter was in the area, but well defended. And of course, this is the home of the Pittsburgh Steelers as well. So they share their practice facility just upriver or downriver, I guess it might be. Beautiful A lot of rivers. facility. And, uh, and of course, this is the home stadium for the NFL Pittsburgh Steelers. What do you think as a high school recruit that means to have the opportunity to come and, like you said, practice right next door in the same building and play in a football facility as beautiful as this one that is the home of one of the great franchises in NFL history. Look, if you're a high school recruit and you come and you visit Pitt and you look out the window and you see the Steelers practice facility right mm -hmm. there and you see them on the field, that gets your attention. Dejon Reynolds with another catch. He's putting together a nice first half of football. Finally tackled by P.J. O'Brien, senior from Pompano Beach, Florida. Reynolds is 6'2", 210, transfer from Florida. A bigger receiver that they will need. Well, this is one of the storied programs, not just in the ACC, but the entire country. They have just a who's who's list. Wow. The retired numbers. The first was Tony Dorsett, number 33, and then we've got uh, the other nine that have come since. There will be more to come. And another one of the things that catches my eye, and they've got great signage around here to illustrate the fact that the University of Pittsburgh football program has 10 guys in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and only three other schools have more than what Pittsburgh can claim. Don't ask me who the other three are. Oh, we're, no we're, idea. we're gonna, I think we've got. I got no idea. <laughs> well, but, there's uh, just some of it right there. Larry Fitzgerald, Dan Marino, Tony Dorsett. And uh, we have chosen this week our kind of five-man Mount Rushmore. And to me, Dorsett and Marino are the non-negotiables. Everybody seems to agree with that, but we differ a little bit lower on the list. Well, Dorsett has a street named after him outside the stadium. <laughs> so he's got to be number one on everybody's list. And my guy, Mark May, has to be on the list. Yeah, the pride of Oneonta, New York, making sure uh, he is recognized today. I got you back, Mark. Look at those yards after catch by Gavin Bartholomew, which is exactly what Kate Bell, the offensive coordinator, told us yesterday. We just have to get this young man the football, and at 6'5", 250, he can make things happen after making the catch. You see it on tape, and you want him to get more touches because he can make people miss or just break tackles. At 84 yards against Tennessee, a speedy team, a couple years ago. Jewels Goff getting a lot of reps for a true freshman for this pit offense. We've got an injured player, Bam Brima. I get the sense that you were trying to say that your list of five was better than my list of five. No, and you know what? What's so cool about coming and, and working a game with a program like this is that you can make those lists and yeah. have great conversations about it. You know, is it just about what they did at Pittsburgh? Is it the totality of their football career? Yeah. I don't see how you don't put Mike well, Ditka on the list. Well, I had to leave him off because, you know, I got Larry Fitzgerald. I got Hugh Green. I mean, who am I taking off? I know. I they know. They got too many great players. It's tough, and we haven't even scratched the surface with getting the entire list on there. But does Mark May have restaurants named after him both in Chicago and here in Pittsburgh? He could if he wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it is something else. And, uh, you know, that list of 10 who are in the Pro Football Hall of Fame is likely to grow in the very near future. Aaron Donald just retired. Yeah. He's going to wind up in Canton, three-time NFL Defensive Player of the Year. And Larry Fitzgerald, I think, 11-time Pro Bowler. He's going to wind up in Canton as well. So that yeah, list I is going to go from 10 to 11 and 11 to 12. I didn't have Aaron Donald on my list. 
I had to take him off to make room for the other guys. You know, Aaron's in the building today. Uh, don't don't say that to him. <laughs> don't, don't, don't tell him what I did. To the end zone, Holstein. He's got himself a touchdown. Daniel Carter out of the backfield on the receiving end to make the score 9-3. I, I think that play is one thing you'll see a lot more of out of Pitt this year. The running backs catching the ball out of the backfield because of the matchups. Anytime that you can get a matchup of a running back who can handle the football, can catch the football against a linebacker, that's a matchup that you should take. And that is a, that's a theme in the NFL, not so much in college. College football tends to look more at space and timing and less with matchups. But that's the marrying of this system here that Cade Bell wants, is to get matchups and to go with speed. Sam Carpenter with the PAT after the touchdown reception by Daniel Carter, who has been a reliable member the last five years, now in his sixth year in the program out of Margate, Florida, and he will turn 24 this June. So nice to have young men leading your program. Well, getting tougher and tougher to have guys who've been around three, four, five years know the program, know the coaches, know the area. You know, you want that chemistry, that culture, and with so many transfers these days, that's a little tougher, and your culture has to be really, really good if you're gonna bring in a lot of new guys year in and year out. Well, over five years, Daniel Carter has appeared in 51 games, started six times, has six career rushing touchdowns, and he's got the first touchdown on a pass from Holstein, whose number's pretty good, especially on that drive. That was a 12-play, 80-yard sustained drive guided by the Alabama transfer, Eli Holstein. Devin Whitlock. And the whistle comes. And the offense will come out onto the field with 17 seconds remaining in the first half. This is as short of a two-minute drill as a quarterback like Yarnell can get. I'm sure he's talking. Oh, he's not using the mic. Face-to-face -face with, with Bell, his offensive coordinator. Let me throw it a couple times. Why not? Yarnell, four games last year, started two to close the regular season and had good numbers, completed 66% of his passes, four touchdowns and one interception. He is the incumbent to the air on first down, well behind the intended receiver, Montrevious Lloyd. You know, the other thing about Nate Yarnell that gets overlooked, he moves really well for a guy who's six foot six. Normally guys that tall have a tougher time, you know, chopping their feet and changing direction. But watching him against Duke last year on tape, he was an effective runner. I think people will be surprised at how well he can move and throw the ball. To the air again on second down. The pass overthrown if it was intended for Kanate Mumfield. In coverage, Kyle Lewis from his linebacker position. He's had a heck of a spring, say the coaches so far. And we've got a penalty marker down on the field. And, and Yarnell tapped his chest, pointed to himself after throwing that ball. So that was on me. Apparently, there's a flag on someone else. Ten-yard penalty, second down. It's Ryan Coretta, 6'5", 305, the redshirt freshman, who was flagged that time. Now, if this were a real game, you'd turn around and hand it off, correct? Yes. Instead, Lloyd goes in motion, swings it out to him. Lloyd gets out of bounds at around the 15-yard line. The clock goes to triple That's zeros. The end of the first half. And that indeed ends the first half of the annual Blue Gold game here at the University of Pittsburgh. 10-3 our score as we learn what the 2024 Pitt Panthers are going to be all about. Head coach Pat Narduzzi 
Enjoy a sandwich, a little nibble on the sideline. He's just an interested observer seeing what his squad has to close out the spring season of football at the University of Pittsburgh. This offense is a lot of deep shots in the first half. And you saw uh, Desmond Reed show you something out of the backfield. He's a running back, pass receiver, tight end Bartholomew. Makes you believe there's a guy that's going to make big plays for you. And then, wow, the defensive line play mm -hmm. for the gold team and the blue team. Just a reminder that defense <laughs> has not changed here at Pitt. It's going to be good again. Yeah, Dayon Hayes, to me, was the most noteworthy of the defensive linemen in that first half. Yep. Rodney Hammond has come into the game, so we've got two different players in the offensive backfield for the blue team wearing red. Christian Veyer, the Penn State transfer who started five games last year for Pittsburgh, hands it off to Rodney Hammond. And with that red jersey, it will take nothing to get the whistle blown by the official. And Christian Veyer is the guy we were talking about earlier, 6'4", 215. What did he start, five games last season or so? Yeah, five games, including yeah. a 302 yard passing, two touchdown effort against Wake Forest. Yeah, good quarterback, but has apparently been jumped in practice by Holstein, so he is working out of, out of the position of the third quarterback, not the second string quarterback everyone expected. Uh, but good looking guy, knows what he's doing, big, strong arm. Well, he played his high school ball in Maryland at the Bullis School, but he is Canadian from Ottawa, Ontario. And he looks the part, as you say, 6'4", 215, a redshirt junior. Well, you know he wants to play well today and see if he can uh, move up the ladder. Bayer with time, a clean pocket Ooh. pass. Incomplete Zion Fowler L. Looked like he could have made that catch. Uh, he put that ball on the money. I mean, that was Fowler L, I think, who looked up at the last minute and didn't realize the ball was on him. But this is a perfect throw. Maybe a little high for him. Zion Fowler L, six feet tall. Not able to reach up and grab that one. And so the punt team comes on. Cam Guess standing at his own eight-yard line with Kenny Johnson back at his 35-yard line to receive. He calls for a fair catch. Steps out of bounds at the 41-yard line. Well, among the former Panthers who have made the uh, trip back to the Steel City, DeMar Hamlin of the Buffalo Bills signing some autographs. Oh, isn't it so good to see him back to normal, up and about, doing his thing and having played last season? It sure is. 15 months removed from that harrowing situation in Cincinnati when he suffered a near-fatal cardiac arrest, able to get back last year, play three preseason games, and then on October 1st, the whole nation watched and kind of held their breath watching yeah. him go out and play in a regular season game after all he'd been through. I can't imagine how tough all that was for his family and his close friends to see him back out there. Had to be really emotional. You know, you want him to do what he wants to do and be comfortable with it, but when you're, when you're close and care about someone like that, you can't help but worry, right? Well, he's one of the uh, real good players in the history of this program. Five years here at Pitt, second team All-ACC, six career interceptions, late yeah. round pick of the Buffalo Bills, and hopefully years to come in yeah. the NFL. Terrific player. Carried by Daniel Carter, the stop by Jimmy Scott. By the way, we've got our fourth quarterback into the game, Ty Diefenbach, number 14, a redshirt freshman from Calabasas, California. And the California kid has his pass deflected, and it falls incomplete. He is another one of the prototypical pocket passers. Six foot six, 220 pounds. And his challenge is to prove that he is a guy who can operate and run with this spread offense, more movement, because they will ask the quarterback to move more in this offense than in the pro style offense. And again, a first year offensive coordinator, Kate Bell, 
who has climbed the ranks very rapidly a 31 year old his first opportunity as an offensive coordinator at the division one FBS level he came from Western Carolina and his goals are very lofty of course every offensive coach would want for his team to you know go for 500 yards of total offense every game and score 50 points but he really thinks he's got a shot to take what he did at the FCS level and the Division II level and yeah. transfer it to the ACC. You see his resume. And for fans out there who go, hey, wait, wait, what's going on? You, you bring a coordinator in from the FCS level up to a Power Four school? Well, what are you thinking? Remind people that Chip Kelly did the same thing before going over to Oregon and changed all of college football. So the, the coaches know good coaching is everywhere mm -hmm. and systems are put in place sometimes at different layers that when you bring it up to this level you catch everybody by surprise and there are the numbers put up by the offensive Cade Bell and he's brought some of his players with him to the University of Pittsburgh and I've only got to imagine Rod that that helps the transition that a guy like Desmond Reed knows the pace and the tempo knows the calls knows the verbiage and can help his teammates get up to speed as well, well he can help teammates but it also gives him a guy like Reed and a guy um, also like um, the other ones they had, they brought over um, Lee, C.J. Lee is also a receiver who came over. They have a little bit of an advantage. They know the offense. They know what to do. And there's a comfort level with, you know, Kate Bell about that. And, yes, they get to help their teammates as well. Yeah. And C.J. Lee not suited up for the scrimmage. He and Raphael Poppy Williams, the two receivers who aren't playing. And again, for this scrimmage, it's essentially a glorified 15th and final practice of the spring for Pitt. And for anybody who has even the slightest hint of an injury, there's no reason yeah. for them to be out there today. So Pitt's playing without those two receivers, also playing without three starting offensive linemen. Their center, Terrence Moore, Ryan Jacoby, and Branson Taylor. On the defensive side of the football, starter Nate Temple is out and may be lost to the season or for the season to an injury suffered earlier this spring. Linebacker Solomon DeShields, one of the leaders. Zach Crothers, one of the promising young freshman defensive linemen not playing. And then most notably, perhaps, in the defensive backfield, the guy who everybody has been talking about on the pass that's incomplete, trying to find Montrevious Lloyd, Cruz Brookins, who earlier today was given the Ed Conway Award as Pitt's most improved defensive player during the spring drills. It's a deep and talented safety room, and yet this redshirt freshman has been the talk of that room. Well, they're going to find a way to get him on the field, whether that's as a safety or in a three safety look or in a nickel back position. I've not seen what he's done on tape in practice, but what the coaches are telling us that he is a natural blitzer. And so you got a guy like that. You're going to keep him on the field, find a way to get him on the field. Well, he led the team in take away helmet stickers this spring and if you saw a photograph of them they aren't just the little Pitt Panther logo stickers they are big massive stickers to let everybody on the field know you have been a playmaker and and that's something defensive coordinator Randy Bates is looking to get back to they want more big playmakers on the defensive side well that's the nature of defense today in college football it used to be that you would try and make the offense go 10 12 14 plays and make a mistake well, because of the big plays, the chunk plays, and no huddle, it's hard to do that. So the name of the game on defense now is negative plays and takeaways. you got to sack the quarterback. you got to throw them for a loss on first down, or you have to take the football away. That's good defense these days. And they think they have the ability to do that, both in the defensive backfield, but also on the edge up front. They have some pretty enticing defensive ends who can make plays. There's a nice play defensively coming up to make the tackle by Rasheem Biles, a sophomore from Columbus. He's a playmaker. Tied Pittsburgh's record with three block punts last year. If he can translate that to the defensive side, he's going to be very valuable. Yeah, you, you talk about good defense. We've had three drives in this second half. Three, three and outs. Jewel's golf he is the running back once again. Freshman from York, PA, motions left. Good pursuit by Rasheem Biles. That's Ball a came fumble. out. Was it a fumble? That's a fumble. Diefenbach, I think, 
only had one hand on the ball as he was running, and I think it got stripped. Yeah, and he's got the ball. Yeah, he lost it. It just came out of his hand. And if I'm Diefenbach, I'm saying, hey, I thought I heard a whistle, and I was just ending the play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, see? Overruled. See? It Overruled. worked. Overruled. <laughs> And so Diefenbach gets another opportunity on third down and 15 from the 40-yard line. Flushed. Eyes downfield. Has the pass complete, but out of bounds. The receiver, or rather, Javante Royal, the defensive back, stepped in, trying to find Izzy Polk. You know, uh, in our conversation yesterday with Cade Bell, the offensive coordinator, he talked about getting the ball out. He wants his quarterbacks to get rid of the ball. And that didn't happen that last play. And you got to be faster with it. That's something they need. Let guys give them a chance to make a play. Caleb Junko, who is the number one punter, although Cam Gasses look good this spring as well. Junko with the opportunity to punt. It goes out of bounds inside the 30 yard line. And that'll take us to break. 6-10 remaining third quarter in this spring game in Pittsburgh. Wednesday night, the Huddle Crew will have its draft film breakdown special highlighting ACC players with the NFL draft less than two weeks away. Our one-hour show begins at 9 Eastern right here on ACCN and the ESPN app. And yes, the draft is April 25th in Detroit. Coverage noon on ESPN and ES, uh, ABC and ESPN. The Bears hold the number one pick, and by the way, the Steelers go 20th overall. And of course, here at the University of Pittsburgh, all talk is about how well this school has been represented over the years, and specifically in recent years, in Pat Narduzzi's tenure in the NFL draft. 14 players drafted since 2021. Tops in the ACC. You see the guys who were drafted last year. And Bub Means is the guy that is on the clock in the April 25th draft for Pitt. Yeah, and I saw a report the other day saying that uh, cornerback MJ Devonshire, one of the big playmakers the last couple of years for Pitt, was receiving interest from the Buffalo Bills and others. So you just never know. They're not going to get the six they had drafted last year, which was right. really something else. But that doesn't mean there's not NFL talent still coming out of this program. We've seen Means back on the, I'm sorry, Desmond Reed back on the field. Had a carry a couple plays ago. Third down, this should be his area. And indeed, he takes the handoff, works his way for a gain of three to bring up fourth down and one. Braylon Lovelace, a sophomore linebacker from Leechburg, Pennsylvania, was plugging that gap. And they're going to go for it on fourth and short. Hit in the backfield. And it looks like it's Lovelace again, who was an impact true freshman last year on special teams and at money linebacker. And he's got a couple of big plays here in the third quarter. Uh, we talk about being aggressive, a little bit more aggressive this year on defense. You saw that time Lovelace, no hesitation. He had a gap assigned to him, and he just ran through that gap and found Desmond Reed right there in the open spot. Well, his highlight last year was a scoop and score against Virginia Tech, and they're hoping for more of that sort of thing this coming fall. You know, the regular season is not that far away. Let me ask you this. Do you think there's any kind of a quarterback battle here? I would say that the ingredients are there. Uh, nothing that has been said by the staff or the players tells me that there is but you know as we talked about in the first half Nate Yarnell has not had an extended stretch to really entrench himself as the number one even though he clearly is right now the number one but yeah. Eli Holstein coming from Alabama seems to be pushing in that direction well I, I think Nate Yarnell is number one I think he's the clear number one I think he is loved by the staff I think they love his work habits and they love everything about him I think the only question is you know, reps. I mean, how much has he played? He hasn't played an awful lot in his career, 
And the last time he was a starter was what? Freshman His junior year? year of high school. Junior year of high school, but for only half the As season. As a reserve. He came yeah. in late and, and got a few starts, and then he yeah. was injured his entire oh, senior high gone. school yeah. season. So I think he's got a chance to lock down the quarterback position and leave no doubt, you know, in the first two or three games of the season. Um, I, I think if he struggles, I think the staff is really optimistic about what Holstein uh, can do. And I think Holstein's been playing well. We, it's hard to judge the quarterbacks today in this game because the defensive lines have been so dominant mm -hmm. against, you know, the makeshift offensive lines we have today. Yeah. And again, the, the, these scrimmages in the spring are just glimpses at what might be. You really can't glean too much out of it because of all the different factors you've been yeah. talking about, Rod. And, and, you know, the play calling has been very vanilla. Coaches yeah. are very wanting not to put on tape some of their tendencies they're looking to do in the fall. And so we are not really seeing anything but a, a facsimile of what Pitt's going to look like in the fall. Well, I think one of the important things is that, you know, Christian Bayer has been out there and has, has looked solid, looked good. And I don't know if he can push and get back to the number two spot. Know, where hosting is right now but he's acquitted himself okay I think today and if he doesn't see that there's an opportunity here hey, other folks are watching him and we know the portal opens in a, in a few days um, I don't see many teams that are going to have five scholarship quarterbacks anywhere in the country no and that's the case at the moment for Pittsburgh Dejon Reynolds off the strike from Diefenbach. Make that Kenny Johnson, excuse me. Well, finally, some protection. Ball comes out quickly. And Reynolds, was that Reynolds or that Johnson? Boy, that two looked very much like a three. That was Johnson. That was Johnson. But I agree, obviously, I thought it looked like a three as well. Yeah. Ball start, well. offense, number 55. Five yard penalty, first down. That's B.J. Williams, the uh, terrific-looking sophomore from Lawrenceville, Georgia, out of Creekside High School, who his coaches say is going to be really good. He's had a really good spring. He won the uh, offensive side for the most improved player yep. uh, this morning. Announced today. Short pass caught by Goff. I think you can see Diefenbach doing a much better job of getting the ball out fast. And Bell has helped him with his play calls, his play selections of, you know, quick passes to get the ball out. Nick James, the Indiana transfer who has had a really nice spring out of IMG Academy, was the injured player. Oh, he is part of the group of transfers that have shown up to rebuild that defensive line. Transfers from K-State, Indiana, Clemson. And that would be Nate Matlack from K-State, the grad transfer from Olathe, Kansas. Twitchy, long, potential playmaker. And David Ojebwe is the young man who transferred from Clemson to Pittsburgh inside the ACC. Johnson down the sideline and into the end zone. An 18-yard touchdown pass play. A little screen game, wide receiver screen. Get the ball out quick and let that guy make a play. Yeah, that's, that is basic Hornbook stuff you want to do. Get the ball out. Let your lineman get down the field and block the corner out of the way. Perfectly timed screenplay. Love the way Johnson came off the line of scrimmage to drive back the cornerback, which allowed the lineman to come out and make the block. So he drove him back to set up a good blocking angle. Well, he was honorable mention all ACC last year as a kick returner. Explosive. They want to get him the football in space and allow for him to make plays. Movement along the defensive front before the point after. Delay game. Defense. Number 98. Half the distance to the goal. Penalty. Remains tried out. That's on Matlack. 
Saw Kenny Johnson have a little fun on the sideline, and why not? Again, he was the number one overall draft pick for this game by his teammates. Well, that tells you what he's been doing in practice all spring. He's been impressing coaches, his teammates, everybody. Number one pick. Do you feel like uh, maybe the, the GMs, the captains for the blue team, regret some of the selections they yes. made? Yes, yeah. absolutely. That point after is good by Sam Carpenter. Johnson on that drive, two receptions, 38 yards, including the score. Now, you know what's at stake tonight. Yes. What's at stake for the winning team is they get a steak dinner. The losing team, they'll, they'll get tofu hot dogs. I didn't even know they had tofu hot dogs. I, didn't, I, look, I, I don't eat hot dogs, so what do I know? I'll eat a hot dog, but I won't eat a tofu hot dog. But see, if you make it hot dogs, some people like hot dogs. But tofu hot dogs, I don't think anybody likes tofu hot yeah, dogs. Yes, so if Aaron Donald or James Conner want, they can get on the steak side of things. I don't think win or lose, they're going to have yeah, to. Yeah, they can have whatever do they hot want. Dog. <laughs> whatever they want. Oh, what a magnificent NFL career just finished by Donald and James Conner with the uh, Arizona Cardinals in the midst of a terrific career. And we've already seen DeMar Hamlin, who has made his way back. Lewis Riddick joined us back in the first quarter. It's a uh, program that is very proud of now, its history. Now the social media team for Pitt should be on this, and this should be going out to all recruits. Yep. This, too, could be you. And there is the head coach heading into his 10th year, Pat Narduzzi. Says we're a tougher team this year. What does he mean by tougher? We need to be tougher than we were in 2023. That's, that's a mentality. I'll give you an example. You know, uh, the weather has been bad out here. And you know what he said? We went outside anyway. Yeah, we, we decided we weren't going to be inside. We're going to go outside and deal with the elements. And you know what? Nobody complained. No belly aching from any players about it. it's too cold, it's too wet, none of that. They're like, let's go get it. We're going to have to play in this in November. Pass let's get after it. Defense, number 15. 15-yard 15 penalty, automatic first down. That's mental toughness. Correction, number 16. Jesse Anderson with the infraction. And it is notable, Nate Yarnell, the number one quarterback, is back onto the field with 2-12 remaining in the third quarter. Yarnell's going to run it. Don't touch him. <laughs> Whistle comes. It's a first down. You know, when you uh, play in the Northeast and in the city of Pittsburgh, you have to lean into cold weather and bad weather situations, I would think, if you're the coach, because you're going to have these conditions come October, November, and later. Well, coaches are always balancing great tackle. Okay, I want my team to get out in the elements, and I want to toughen them up versus I want to have a good practice and execute some things. So that, that's the, the delicate balance you're trying to find. And sometimes you lean towards, I need to have a good practice more so than the elements. A nice tackle you talk about, Rod, was made by Jesse Anderson, a freshman defensive back from Fort Lauderdale out of Cardinal Gibbons High School. Yarnell throws that's, it away, and we've got another flag coming. That's a sack. It should have been a sack. Personal foul, illegal hands to the face, offense, number 63, 15-yard penalty, first down. And I ask you this question because I really don't remember. Back in your day at Stanford, what did you guys do in the spring? Oh, well, we always went outside. It was always sunny and warm and beautiful. <laughs> out, out to practice and then to the baseball game afterwards. That's right, where you might have been playing. Did you do both at the same time? Would you have done I, spring football I, I did, and I did play? spring football and baseball my freshman year. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, the weather in uh, Palo Alto is usually ideal. Yeah. It's more than four. Well, we'd like to uh, welcome Ooh. now a gentleman we just saw on camera with uh, some of the former Pitt greats, James Conner of the Arizona Cardinals. How are you, sir? I don't know if James can hear us, but we will try to get back to him. Penalty moves it over to the 44-yard line. 
Coach Narduzzi watching his gold team lead his blue team 17 to 3. A lot of penalties today. Something that has to get cleaned up, obviously, and has uh, made this game a bit uneven, a little choppy. Yarnell throws a strike for a completion. Cameron Montero with the first down catch. Saw the arm strength there on that deep out. Beautiful throw by Yarnell. Played behind Hudson Card in high school. To the end zone. It's a touchdown for Yarnell. Put it right on the money. 34 yards. And on the receiving end, Lamar Seymour, a true freshman out of Miami Central High School. We were just talking about Yarnell's arm strength and the fact that this team, this offense, takes more deep shots. And that was a beautifully thrown ball, a great route, great little post route. And he did the essential thing. He gave his receiver a chance, put air under the ball, and let him run underneath it. Well, Tamarian Crumpley was the defensive back who was beaten on that play. Ben Sauls with the point after. And it pulls the blue team back to within seven. Now, Seymour is another one of the intriguing true freshmen who have joined the program out of a uh, terrific high school program. Some of the guys who played football at Miami Central include Antonio Brown, Willis McGahee, Devontae Freeman, Dalvin Cook, James Cook, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Wow. If Lamar Seymour has that sort of impact here at Pitt, the folks will be thrilled. Well, we, we've seen the big play potential out of this spread, no huddle offense. Pace, much quicker. And it was good to see Yarnell get back out there and get some more reps here in the third quarter. And he looked good on that six play, 80 yard scoring drive. Three for three for 42 yards and the touchdown. Yeah, that's why you bring him back out. I mean, things were a little bit disrupted for him early on with the play of the defensive line. Get him back out there, have a nice drive, and he gets to show off his arm and make a big throw. When you're rushing that edge, understand, you get up to the depth of the quarterback, you got to come back inside. And we will head to the fourth quarter, and we will talk to James Conner when we come back. He's back to see his alma mater play its annual spring game here at Akershire Stadium. We head to the fourth quarter of this blue gold game in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The gold leads the blue 17 to 10. And we're so pleased to be joined now by the former Panther 2014 ACC Player of the Year, James Conner. Welcome back, former first team All-American. Thanks for joining us, James. And you made the trip to come back to see your alma mater's scrimmage why what do you get out of coming back and seeing the guys uh man i just get grounded you know i get humbled i get grounded um this is my foundation you know so i come back and uh you know just this atmosphere seeing these colors you know this this, uh, this blue and yellow this blue and gold um it's just uh you know it's home for me so uh right before the, you know the, the next season coming up i like to come back home and just get grounded james what is it about that because lewis riddick said the same thing to us he said this this is home what is that? Can you describe to us what that is, why you guys feel that way? Uh, I think it is the way we was treated while we was here. You know, the University of Pittsburgh, you know, came in when I was 18, and uh, it was all hands on deck. Everybody on staff and when I was there just, uh, you know, embraced me, helped me. You got guys still like Coach Asala and Coach Narduzzi who really helped me become a boy to a man, you know. So I just, uh, I'm just always appreciative and grateful of that. And like I said, it's my foundation that carries me through, you know, uh, on into life. So it's just uh, good to get a taste of home. Hey, so you've got a lot of young running backs around you. What kind of advice do you give them? I mean, you're a guy who, I mean, you just, you're coming off a great season with the 1,000 yards rushing. Uh, so they all listen to you. What, what do you tell them? 
Uh, man, I just tell them to have fun playing the game. That's the most important thing, you know, because uh, with the business part of it and how much work is actually required, to, you know, to put in, uh, it, it starts to get hard. It starts to feel like a job sometimes. But if you can still find the fun in it, you know, that the love that you had for it when you were a kid, then, uh, you know, you have fun and that takes over, you know, and so you start enjoying, enjoying it and appreciating it for what it's worth. Well, James, we were talking earlier in the broadcast about what it must be like for a University of Pittsburgh football player and a recruit to be able to come and know that you're going to practice and play at an NFL facility. Facility. You got to do that, and then you got drafted by the Steelers and only had to go to the other side of the building. What was that experience like for you? Yeah, it was uh, it was awesome, especially being a student at the time. You know, just uh, knowing that the Steelers were right there practicing and uh, being able to watch those guys. You know, that was the ultimate end goal was to get to the NFL. So uh, to see it right there in front of you on a daily was just all the inspiration that you needed. You know, and so uh, and then after you get drafted, you go right there. Uh, you start to get comfortable. And you start to realize that you know I still got my my foundation right there at Pitt, right there uh, beside of me. You know, so it, it worked out, and it was a great four years with the Steelers. But now the Steelers are the opponent. You came back this last season, Week 18, into this building and got the game ball leading the Cardinals to a win how did how did that feel for you oh that was awesome you know it was awesome I definitely wanted to come in there and try to have a big game uh, get the victory um, and I also see old friends and family you know this uh, a lot of the family came up and see me play you know they don't get a chance to do that going all the way out to Arizona so uh, it was a nice game and a nice weekend overall hey James one quick question for you uh, you've shown tremendous patience in your NFL career um, what, what brings that out? I mean, a lot of guys would not have hung in there the way you have, and to top it off with the season you had last year, mm -hmm. I mean, that has to be rewarding. How, where does that patience come from, and how do you have that? Uh, you could say patience, but I would say faith. Uh -huh. You know, just, uh, I know that I'm a talented football player, and, uh, you know, injuries are part of the game, uh, hardships, trials, and tribulations, but everything you go through, you know, there's something better on the other side. So, uh, yeah, I'm just in that. Like I've said, I'm in it for the long haul. You know, I want to have a, a great career and make a great career out of it, and I know with the hard work you know, that that's possible. So uh, I work hard, you know, year in and year out, and uh, that got, got me to this point, year eight, and uh, more years to go. Well, you are in the midst of doing just that. Thanks so much, James, and congratulations for all of your success. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thanks, pal. ACC record 26 rushing touchdowns yeah. a decade ago. Yeah. One season, 26 rushing touchdowns. Well, and, you know, at the time, you know, people were um, really thrown when they found out that he had battled cancer. Yeah. And he's done all that and come through all that and has had a fantastic NFL career. And he's not done. He's not done yet. No doubt about that. Well, we get a look uh, for the first time at... A local quarterback out of Penn Hills High School, Julian Duggar. Montrevious Lloyd with the football, able to pick up about seven yards on the play. And by the way, if we didn't mention it, we have a running clock now for the fourth quarter, and so that's why the clock is not stopping in between plays. This young man was high school quarterback, as you mentioned, also a point guard on the basketball team. And I mention that because, you know, he has this philosophy of, Full hey. Full start, offense. Number 54, five-yard penalty, first down. My job is to spread the ball around. It's not about me. So Julian Duggar gets a chance to show that. Yeah, and Rod, it wasn't just any basketball team. He led Penn Hills to the 2023 Class 5A state championship yeah. Yeah. last year. Yeah. So winning is in his DNA, following the same path as Pittsburgh football greats Bill Fralick and Aaron Donald out of Penn Hills. Montrevious Lloyd. Now, he was said to be the most unhappy player about not being the first running back taken off the draft board on Wednesday. <laughs> he let the guys know, hey, wait a second. I'm not number two. I'm not number three. I should be number one. Clearly, he didn't lobby his teammates well enough before the draft. Nope. Well, the uh, redshirt freshman from St. Petersburg, Florida, getting his opportunity here in the fourth quarter out on the field. What a tremendous pass rush by Dayon Hayes, number 50 who just took his blocker back, all the way back, into Duggar's uh, lap, essentially. And you know, Hayes has done a tremendous job of leading the true freshman on the defensive line. He always sits in the front of the room. He has 12 career sacks, a real difference maker for Pitt defense. But he has taken Sincere Edwards, among the others, under his wing and trying to pass along what it means to be a Pittsburgh football player. Yeah, well, you, you see, Leadership can come also just in the form of how you play and how you go about your business, and he's showing that today. And there is number 50, Dayon Hayes, out of Westinghouse Academy. Another Pittsburgh guy. 
Sean Fitzsimmons sitting next to him, a really promising defensive tackle from Manaka, PA. And the uh, ceiling is very high for that young man. And as you've said repeatedly, Rod, Randy Bates, his defense yep. is going to bring it. Well, they're going to need that. Things aren't getting any easier in the ACC, which, by the way, has gotten larger. Your alma mater. For now, 2024. Flag comes down before the uh, ball is thrown by Julian Duggar. Yeah, SMU, Cal, and Stanford have been added to the ACC. And so uh, they are three tremendous institutions of learning. Well, that excites me for, for Pitt fans who you know, get a chance to perhaps go visit these places if they haven't before. Uh, I believe, um, you know, there's, there'll be games out on the West Coast and vice versa. It'll be a new thing for fans to experience. So I think that part of it's exciting. Um, the travel part of it won't be as challenging for the existing members of the ACC as it will be for SMU, Cal, and Stanford who will be doing a lot more travel, yeah. more than they have in the past. One of the walk-on quarterbacks, Jake Frantel, a junior from Aaron, Wisconsin, number 17 in red, getting an opportunity to play with 3.30 and counting left in the fourth quarter. Frankel puts it up. And incomplete. Jake McConaughey. Redshirt freshman, a redshirt senior receiver from Verona, New Jersey, was the intended target. Yeah, so again, you've got two walk-on quarterbacks in a seven-man quarterback room. David Lynch and Jake Frantel are the two walk-ons. And it just is hard to believe that there are going to be five scholarship quarterbacks on the roster when, in August, they open up the regular season here against Kent State. Yeah. And I think it's I think it's imperative for Pitt to get off to a good start. And I think the schedule should allow them to do that. The Kent State opener gives them a chance to work out some of the kinks in live game action with the new offense. And then, you know, Cincinnati, that's a tough place to play. And then you come home and get West Virginia. And that, well, that's the backyard brawl. And as you mentioned, uh, you notice Cal and SMU on the schedule. Those are conference games. And so... November 2nd at SMU. That's a beautiful campus. Good time of year to go to Dallas if you want to see the Pitt Panthers on the road. That's a good road trip. Well, it's a different road trip. I mean, it's a road trip that Pitt fans haven't had on the calendar before. So that alone makes it intriguing. So we've got fourth down and seven. As we look again at the uh, season opener against Kent State August 31st. They'll wind down the regular season November 30th at Boston College. You get the California sturdy Golden Bears, Reese Davis would say, showing up here in, um, in October. That'll be blue and gold mm -hmm. on blue and gold. It will. It'll look an awful lot like this. No doubt about it. Unless they come up with some alternative, alternate third or fourth <laughs> uniform as every school I, seems I'm, to I'm have. I'm getting the sense that is not your thing. <laughs> I like traditional. I, I like in football where the home team always wore their colored uniform and you wore the white on the road. And same in basketball and baseball, the home whites and the road colored. It just was easier. Yeah. I like things in order. So, yes, you're right. You know what the young guys are saying. Oh, he's oh, so old. That old he guy. is just yelling to get <laughs> off the lawn. <laughs> I have to say, some of the new looks are pretty good. There it just go. makes it tough when you're watching television sometimes. You don't know who's home, who's away. Which team is which? <laughs> well, what we have here is uh, all Pittsburgh on the field. Pat Narduzzi getting his team ready for the start of his 10th season as head coach at the University of Pittsburgh. This is the 15th and final workout of their spring. And then they won't be together formally until camp opens up this summer. 10th season, won an ACC championship back in 2021. And now no divisions. Top two teams will play in the ACC championship uh, game this year. Well, since 2015, only Clemson has more wins in the ACC than Pat Narduzzi's Pitt Panthers. They have been consistently good. He's had nine first-team All-Americans at Pitt, six NFL draft picks in 2023 alone. And 
with a stoppage. We will take a break and come back to wrap things up. Although it looks like plays continuing. That's a sack. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll take a break and come back right after this here in Pittsburgh. Welcome back to Acrisure Stadium, where we have a final score in the Pitt Spring game. Gold 17, blue 10. That means a steak dinner for the boys in white or gold and tofu hot dogs for the blue. Whatever that is, oh. right? <laughs> <laughs> Not good. Well, what did you think of what you saw here today, Rod? I, I, I think there was reason for optimism. Um, the offense was a little bit hampered by penalties and by the defensive line play. But I think you got to see the pace and how wide open things were. And you saw a number of deep shots, which is something that maybe you haven't seen in the past. And then you saw a couple guys make some big plays. So I think you're starting to see some playmakers on offense. And then on the other side for defense, nothing to worry about. Same old pit defense, same aggressiveness, you know, good players. And they were missing some guys, too. So I think uh, there's reason to have a lot of optimism and hope for Pitt in this new ACC this season and with a 12-team playoff. Well, the regular season will open up August 31st right here against the Kent State Golden Flashes. Great to see all the former Panthers come back and support their program today. Just a fun day all around. Absolutely. They were all here and so much, so much love for the program. Terrific day. Well, that'll do it from Acrisure Stadium, where once again the gold beat the blue 17 to 10 in our annual scrimmage for Rod Gilmore and our entire crew. I'm Doug Sherman saying so long from Pittsburgh.